Today I'm going to talk to you about using theory to understand the mechanisms of thermally activated delayed fluorescence, which is being increasingly uh, exploited and used in organic light emitting diodes. So first of all, I'll outline the basic principles of thermally activated delayed fluorescence, and then move on to the role of molecular vibrations uh, in activating uh, TADF, and then considering the role of solid state solvation, so the effect of the molecule uh, embedded within an organic host which is native to the device, and then how this influences the full width half maximum of the emission, which is important in the color purity of these devices, and finally the role of the density of states. So thermally activated delay fluorescence, or TADF for short, is not a new process. It was first observed in the uh, early 1920s, but in the last five years has emerged as a very promising approach to high efficiency organic light emitting diodes following the work of Chitaira Dachi in Kyushu University. And the idea in the context of OLEDs is that upon the electrical excitation, 75% of the molecules are excited into non emissive triplet states, while 25% are in these emissive single states. So if we want to achieve efficient devices, we have to find a way of harnessing the energy within these triplet states. This was initially achieved using phosphorescent materials containing elements such as iridium, but TADF offers an opportunity to achieve this using purely organic materials. And the way of doing this is to minimize the energy gap between the two states of interest, so that thermal energy can enhance the transfer of population from the triplet state into the singlet state, driving emission from the singlet state and achieving high efficiency. The one challenge of this is we don't have to only consider the energy gap between these two states. We also have to consider what actually drives the communication between the two states. So most molecules in the literature exhibiting TADF are based upon charge transfer molecules, such as the one shown here, in which we have an electron donor group and an electron acceptor group, which are coupled via a bond. And upon excitation, an electron is transferred from the donor group to the acceptor group, generating a charge transfer state. The problem arises in when we consider in what actually couples the two states. So between singlets and triplet states, these are coupled by a spin-orbit coupling. And the spin-orbit coupling actually has two components which are really important. It has the spin angular momentum and the orbital angular momentum term. And so when we're moving from a triplet state to a singlet state, we're changing the spin term and to conserve total angular momentum, we have to compensate this with a change in orbital angular momentum. But in most cases with the charge transfer states where we have these close line singlets and triplet states, these are composed of the same orbital characteristics. So in this case, we've assumed that it's a homo-lumo excitation. And in this scenario, there is no change in the orbital angular momentum Therefore, total angular momentum is not conserved when we're changing the spin, and as a result, the spin orbit coupling is going to be close to, if not zero. In the quantum dynamics work that we performed, what we found for this molecule is that there is also another triplet state which lies below the two charge transfer states, and this is a locally excited state based on the donor group. It's also a triplet state. And these two triplet states can actually couple by what's called vibronic coupling. And this vibronic coupling mixes the character of the two states and actually opens up a chance for efficient transfer to the singlet states. And so what we observed is that by including this lower line triplet state into the calculations, the rate of conversion into the singlet states increased by four orders of magnitude. So as one would, would maybe assume from the word vibronic, this is activated or this mixing is driven by particular molecular vibrations. 
Therefore, identifying them is going to be key in terms of designing new efficient uh, TADF molecules. So in the case of the example shown here, what we found is that it's actually torsional motion between the donor and the acceptor group that actually drives this coupling and makes efficient TADF molecules. The other implication of this work is that we no longer have to consider just one energy gap, this delta E here, but we also have to consider the energy gap to this lower lying state because the closer this state is going to be to the, to the other charge transfer states, the larger the mixing is going to be and the more efficient it's going to be in terms of TAPF. The implications of these, these two states is also the fact that we have to now carefully consider how the molecule interacts with its environment. The reason for this is that these two states are your charge transfer states. These exhibit a large molecular dipole. And so will be strongly affected by the polarity of the environment directly around the TADF emitter. In contrast, this state, which is a locally excited state on the donor, has no or very small dipole moment, and therefore won't be affected by the environment. So we can harness an approach called host tuning now, in which we select the host molecule with a certain polarity to tune the charge transfer states down in energy, achieving them to be isoenergetic with the locally excited state. So the molecule itself doesn't necessarily have to be efficient in, for example, a low polarity environment, because by changing the environment and changing how the molecule interacts with this, we provide the opportunity to actually uh, make all of these states isoenergetic and increase the TADF mechanism. The key thing in terms of the OLED device is that we're no, not actually thinking about solution solvation in which the molecules are free to move and reorient according to the changing dipole associated with the charge transfer state, but we're considered solid state solvation in which the environment can only move a very small amount because of the rigidity of the solid. The other impact of the solid state of an OLED device is that it will hinder to some extent uh, molecular vibrations. Low frequency vibrations are likely to be more hindered than high frequency vibrational modes. And so understanding how the solid state then affects the vibrations which ultimately play a role in TADF is, is also an important role um, in terms of molecular design. This then brings us on to consider how the molecular vibrations contribute to the full width half maximum of the emission. So we want narrow emitters on the order of less than 50 nanometers. Charge transfer states that are associated with TADF generally have a very broad emission on the order of greater than 100 nanometers. And this broad emission is associated with specific molecular vibrations that, that are active in the excited state and search different conformations within the potential energy surface. So what we have to want to do in molecular design is identify the molecular vibrations that contribute to TADF and identify the molecular vibrations that cause this broad fall with the half maximum and see if they're in separate regions of the molecule and whether we can design synthetic strategies to remove the latter while keeping efficient thermally activated delayed fluorescence. In the case of the example that we have here on the board, what we've observed is that the vibrational motion most responsible for the full width half maximum is the breathing mode of this bond between the donor and the acceptor group. And so if we want to achieve a narrower full width half maximum, the most obvious approach is to make this bond uh, more rigid. Unfortunately, as I said earlier, the torsion between these two uh, units is also responsible for thermally activated delay fluorescence. And so in this case, if we actually make this bond more rigid, we will also make TADF less efficient because 
it also requires motion around the same bond. And so understanding how the molecule moves at this level is going to be crucial if we want to optimize the full width half maximum and the TADF performance. One of the final things to consider is also the role of the density of states. So if we consider Fermi's golden rule, there's not only the coupling, i.e. the spin orbit coupling, or the vibronic coupling between the two transitions that plays a role, but it's also the density of excited states. So in this molecule here, we have three excited states which are close in energy and which couple. One of the common examples in the literature is not to use donor acceptor molecules, but to also have another donor group here so we have the donor, acceptor, donor um, format of the molecule. Now in this case we can actually envisage that this doubles the number of excited states because we also have now another locally excited state on this donor group and charge transfer states from this donor group to the acceptor. What we can show though by molecular symmetry is that these two sets of states generated from this donor acceptor and this donor acceptor will not interact, or certainly a first order will not interact. And so the enhancement of the density of states in this case shouldn't lead to a massive enhancement of the performance of the device. And indeed, this is actually what we see because both this molecule and its donor acceptor donor analog give a similar performance of about 20% external quantum efficiency. However, very recently, in collaboration with Andy Monkman and Martin Bryce's group at Durham, we developed a new molecule which has a rigid donor core, which is based on the truxene molecule, and three acceptor units coming off the side. The acceptor units in this case are exactly the same as seen here, and so the, the vibrational motions responsible for TADF are very similar in the case of this molecule. But the key difference is that we have 30 excited states within 0.1 or 0.2 EV of the lowest lying states. And so the molecular motions in this case also lead to multiple surface crossings between the states which enhance the coupling and enhance the transfer of population between the singlets and triplet states. And what we found in this case is actually the triplet harvesting, so the rate in which we convert these triplet states into singlet states, is similar to what we find with iridium phosphorescent um, emitters. And so this really opens a new paradigm for TADF emitters with high efficiency. So I hope I managed to convey the main principles of thermally activated delayed fluorescence and the, th the contribution the theory can make to understanding this. Just leaves me to thank the numerous collaborators involved in this project, including the Organic Electroactive Active Materials Group at Durham, uh, um, Andy Mugman and Martin Bryce's group, uh, my group here in Newcastle, and also the funders involved um, the uh, EPSRC.